introduce my colleague, Professor uh, Joanna Bridger. And uh, yeah, okay. So as uh, Joe introduced me, I am introducing her. Uh, we are um, good pals, and in fact, uh, because of our interest in research in uh, chromosome biology, we call each other chromosome sisters. And, uh, um, and uh, she was at Brunel before me. She started uh, with a lectureship in 1999, so when I joined in 2005, she was my official mentor. And uh, she's uh, teaching um, embryogenesis uh, in, uh, uh, in biomedical sciences at Brunel. Um, she has got a daughter, Calico, born in 2012, and uh, she was 46 years old when she had uh, Calico. So I suppose because we are chromosome sisters, then I think Alessia and Calico must be cousin. Um, so yes, she likes my food, I like cooking, so we are a very good combination, and she's uh, very fond of cult movies. And on this note, I will give the uh, chance to um, Joe to speak through the video. Thank you. Nice to see you again. Um, so thank you, Sabrina, very much for that very informative part, first part of the lecture. And thank you for telling us about how we make Leslie and Tracy uh, that need to come together with their one set of chromosomes each in the right way to then create an embryo, no matter how that's created, uh, in a fallopian tube or in a petri dish, um, we still need the one sperm and the one egg and the same kind of reactions and mechanisms that go ahead. And only one, Tracy, is allowed to enter into Leslie's shell. Okay, so let's get on with that. As I say, as you will know, that there are millions of sperm produced, and so it is only one that must and should enter the egg. And so we are, um, the, the egg will be surrounded by lots and lots of sperm. And it isn't necessarily the first sperm that gets to the egg that is going to be the winner, the one that is, is is the fertilizer, the one that's going to fertilize that egg and add its chromosomes into the egg. Um, it's not always the case, but the first sperm that gets there does set off the reactions that I will tell you about in a moment. So fertilization, two becomes one. So we come from two cells to make this one cell that then has a complete set of chromosomes again. One set from the, from the, the sperm and one set from the, the egg. And there are so many ways now that people have, scientists have developed to be able to recapitulate this fertilization, being able to do it in the laboratory using a microscope and all these different techniques come under the, the umbrella of art, assisted reproductive technology. And you will have another lecture next time in two weeks from Professor Claire Lynch talking about art in a different way through, through her discipline of creative writing. And so commonly now um, we have in vitro fertilization. So this is where, if we're thinking about art, this is where um, sperm and eggs are added together in a petri dish. And so those sperm are able to um, be attracted to the egg for what, it's, um, what it has on its, on its uh, membranes. And, and so it's attracted to the egg and also then can penetrate the egg. So it's, it's in a, an environment that that is able to happen. If the sperm are somehow compromised and they're fine swimming or, or finding the egg difficult, then they just get some help from a needle and they can be injected into the egg. And so therefore you then get sort of um, the, the chromosomes that the sperm head is then transferred artificially then into the egg. But you still get fertilized egg, fertilization, and the egg um, has an extra set of chromosomes then from the sperm. And that then allows um, embryogenesis to go ahead. Okay, so that's called ICSI. 
intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Okay, so that means that the sperm is injected into the cytoplasm of the, of the egg. There are other um, advances that help um, fertilization and uh, conception and um, implantation move forward. And then with embryos that are made outside of the body, they can be, um, they're being uh, implanted into the, into the, into the, into the womb, but also gametes can be uh, transferred. So the gametes can be transferred into the fallopian tubes and that's called gift, a zygote. So the initial, um, just after fertilization, that can be put into the fallopian tube rather than the womb. Okay, pronuclear stage also. There's a very early stages of embryogenesis. People are having a, a success with using, I should say scientists or, or clinicians, at IVF clinics, etc., are having a lot of success with transferring frozen embryos. So embryos that have, that have been frozen in the liquid nitrogen um, quite safely, but instead of allowing them to thaw out to a body temperature before being uh, transferred, they are placed in frozen and that seems to work pretty well. So that's quite an, uh, an interesting step forward. Uh, sometimes the embryos struggle with hatching. So we have an embryo comes that it hatches. So a human embryo, a mammalian embryo comes out of, of a shell and that, and then embeds into the endometrial lining of the womb. And so sometimes that is assisted outside of the body in the Petri dish. And then that helps uh, when the embryo is, is transferred. Some cytoplasm from another egg, a donor egg can be injected into, into the um, recipient's egg. And that can help sometimes make the, the egg more receptive to being fertilized. And now we have what's called embryo glue. So this is um, the substance that you get around a very early embryo, hyaluronin, um, that can then be used to, to, that goes around the embryo, and then that can be implanted into the womb and allows the embryo to stick because there are some, or quite a few problems sometimes with implantation. So the fertilization is fine, but once, that very early embry embryo, the blastula gets to the, to the womb, it struggles to implant into the lining of the womb. And then we have different aspects, different ways of um, getting the sperm into, into various areas of the, of the reproductive, female reproductive system, taking um, sperm from directly from testes also, instead of waiting for an ejaculate. So we've, we've got a wide range of, 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 of advancements around uh, assisted conception, assisted um, reproductive technology, and they are only, there's only more and more being added to them all the time. So people are working on this all the time. And then the last lecture, we will look at some of the, the more, uh, the latest advancements that are coming. So it's really important um, to set up a developing embryo correctly. So it, it's not just about a sperm and an egg coming together. You need then a lot of different um, mechanisms and processes to happen. And that happens virtually straight away from when that first sperm hits, hits the egg. And that where that sperm hits the egg is called the sperm entry point. And that already sets up some asymmetry in the embryo. Okay, and you can see that we are, um, we're not a big round ball of cells. Um, as you can see, like this, this is the egg here, but we're not a round ball of cells like very early embryos are. We have, we're elongated, we have a top and a bottom, we have structures on the outside, and we have a lot of structures on the inside. And those structures and tissues and organs um, need to be placed exactly in the right uh, areas of the body. Okay, so where that first sperm hits, and this is a wave of calcium that you can see across the egg. So this blue round sort of biscuit looking thing looks a bit like a blue biscuit on greaseproof paper. 
This is the sperm entry point here where you can see the green. So the green is recording a wave of calcium. It's a bit like a Mexican wave. Woo! Okay, let's do a Mexican wave. Woo! Right. But you can see that it comes from one point then across the egg. So this is already setting up some asymmetry. And we are then going to get axes developed from this, this first point of where the sperm hits. And you need calcium. This is the calcium wave and calcium is, is um, released in the egg. So have a really healthy egg, needs plenty of calcium and what we call cations. So maybe some sodium too. So it's important to have, to have plenty of, of those um, cations around. So then what happens with the sperm? So we get this sperm hits, okay? And it's going to recognize receptors on the outside of the egg, which it binds to, okay? And then it, we get some fusion of the membranes between the egg and the sperm. You know, the membranes are made out of lipids, a bit like oils, like you see in your washing up bowl when you haven't got enough washing up liquid in there that they come together they they fuse quite easily but in the sperm head you have got this pocket of um enzymes that are ready to digest the 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 outside of the egg and burrow and then the sperm can burrow its way through and so it also creates a protuberance of something made of what's called microtubules so these are structures that can push and help that sperm penetrate into the egg, releasing its DNA. So this is the, the nuclear DNA here. So this is the sperm nucleus represented here. Okay, and then that sets off a whole load of reactions from the egg side. So the sperm has its reactions and then the egg also has um, a whole set of reactions. So underneath the membranes, and I have to tell you that this, this image is, is from a sea urchin. It's a cartoon of a sea urchin, but actually at a very simple level, we're quite similar to sea urchins. And so a lot of fertilization, early embryogenesis is looked at in sea urchins as a model. Although if you fall on one in Greece on holiday, uh, it's not very pleasant. So don't do that. Anyway, so we have these uh, cortical granules that are around the outside of the egg. And they're also containing all these enzymes um, that are going to be released upon this. When we get this calcium wave, then they start to release their, their contents. And what happens is the sperm get the connections between the sperm and the egg, their proteins, and so they get, they get eaten up. And then we've got all these what's called a mucopolysaccharide, basically like mucus. So it's thick and viscous, but it attracts water through, through osmosis. And so we get a swelling. So you get not only digestion, but a physical swelling that's then going to push those sperm away. And you can see here that we've got this, this swelling and then the hyaline layer is very hard to get through as well. So we get this release of all the other sperm. So once there's a sperm head that's got in, that's it. No other sperm should be able to get in. And so we need to, to do that because if you have more than one sperm, you're going to have too many chromosomes. And this sometimes happens. Okay, it's very rare in humans, but it's, it is, it's not, um, it does happen occasionally. I do have a video here, so hopefully I can show you the video. These are sea urchin eggs, and we've got sperm being put in the Petri dish with them. Th these are these things that are buzzing around, look like flies. Uh, I don't know if we can go back, play it again. Okay, and so you can see that membrane, that swelling up, pushing all the sperm away. No more sperm can get in. So once we get the, the sperm entry point and we're starting to get, um, we start to get cell division. So you need, you don't just need one cell, right? You need, you need lots and lots of cells to build that very early embryo and then to go on from there to make the, the tissues and, the, um, and the, the organs. We also have to think about 
got that ball of cells, but this structure is going to have a top and a bottom, anterior, posterior. It's going to have a right and a left, and it's going to have a dorsal and a ventral area. So dorsal is the back and ventral is the front. And you can see that there's all these different structures and organs and, and uh, muscles are all in these places. And so that has to be um, mapped for, it has to be, um, there's a blueprint for establishing all this in the right way. So we, we need to establish these axes and this is done through gradients of, of, um, of compounds or proteins or messenger RNA that's going to make proteins. Okay, and we have that within the eggs. And this is a very simple um, a cartoon here. And these are, this is from, um, which was, uh, I think, yeah, from a, a frog egg. Okay, so the sperm hits, we get a twisting. Okay, so we get, we've got these in the egg, we've got these components here. It's called disheveled. We won't even worry where that comes, what that name comes from. But with that twisting, we get a mixing of components. Okay, and this component will prevent some gene expression happening, but allow a gene expression to happen. So where we get this, we get a gradient. So a gradient is like, you know, when somebody has got an ombre hair, hairstyle, so it, it goes from one color to the other. So you have a higher concentration, say, of, of brown at the top, and then a, it's lighter and lighter. And so the concentration of that, where a cell or a piece of tissue is sitting in that in that area it matters what concentration they are uh, they are exposed to and that the concentration of that helps organize the timing and the particular gene expression that you would get that would then allow other genes to be expressed other genes to be expressed to then make the structures of the body Okay, here and in the, this is a it's a fruit fly embryo, and hopefully you can see the gradient from. Sorry, that was my timer. Better speed up. Okay, and so you would see you can see here the gradient of the blue. This is the the head part of the of the um, Drosophila fruit fly embryo, and this is the back part. And so you have a gradient of blue and a gradient of red. And these establish the anterior and the posterior axes of the, of the Drosophila. So you're gonna get head structures here and um, posterior structures created there. So these are all important. And these are mechanisms that have to work correctly when, um, when, a, when an egg is fertilized. Okay, so this is, what those first early uh, cell divisions look like in the embryo. This is in a mouse, so it's a, a mammal. And it's got sperm, okay, and then we get a two cell, so you get these divisions, then a, a four cell, so the two cells are divided. Both of them have become four cells, then eight cells, and then we get a compaction where the cells can then signal and talk to each other much more easily. Okay, and then they organize themselves in out identity, which means that the cells that know that they're going to be at the edge are organized more towards the edge and they become the cells that are going to interact with the endometrium and become the placenta. The, well, the embryo, it donates tissue, it, it, it creates some of the tissue for the placenta, as does the mother, and so comes together uh, in that way. So, but in mammals, Unlike other, unlike other um, organisms, we get quite a complex division. So not only are the cells um, dividing in one way, they can divide in different angles at the same time. Whereas say here we have a fish early embryo, all the division is across the top in a very structured, the cell division, very structured formation almost looks like, you know, a baker's dozen of, of, uh, of nice, fresh rolls from, from the bakery. But mammals are more complex. And so we are able to, the cells will divide at different times and different angles. And, uh, and so making that much more complex. And so there are, even in these early, early stages of embryogenesis, things can go wrong. 
But what you can get from this image is that we're quite similar in some ways, our divisions to sea urchins and that. So looking at early, early embryos, there's not a lot of difference between the structures that you can see from much more simple organisms. And that's because we have evolved from much more simple organisms. But there's a, a really fascinating set of genes that you find in, um, in different species of animals. So here we have, again, the fruit fly, the Drosophila, expressing these genes, and these are called the Hox genes. So, um, and we, I love teaching this to the students because it is such a fascinating uh, setup. Um, and what happens is you have these Hox genes in clusters on our chromosomes, and they are expressed, they come in a particular sequence, and they are expressed in that sequence. So Hox, say we go to Hox D here, Hox D1 will be expressed before Hox D3, D4, D8, same along here. Okay, so they are expressed in that order down the chromosome, but that's the order that they are expressed and required down the body, okay? So you have the red ones here, the purple, the yellow, the blue, the orange and the green down the body of this, this human baby. But that's the same order that you would find them in Drosophila, in worms, in frogs, fish. We keep this order because it's extremely important that these genes are expressed in the right order, in the right place, at the right time, in the right concentration. And so it's important that when they are exposed to what I was talking about, those gradients, that they express the right amount because too much is as bad as too little. And you can then get uh, abnormalities in structures. And even very early on, if there is a misexpression, uh, a problem with the Hox gene expression, then this usually leads to a miscarriage that's, that's even before implantation or, or around implantation that people wouldn't even realize that they had had become pregnant. So, and I just wanted to show you this lovely picture, which is these genes that have been um, stained for. They've actually been probed with DNA with their specific sequences and picked up in these different colors. So you can see here, lab, lab, DFD, DFD, SC, SCR here. So they are in that order. So really, these genes are very important in setting up um, where the different structures in our body are going to be. And one of these master Hox regulator genes sets up a whole cascade of gene expression to make, say, a whole eye. Uh, so they're, they're right at the beginning of, of creating um, different structures. So it's incredibly important. So then you have the implantation of the embryo. It requires vitamin D. It has happens in a small window of time um, between days 16 and 22. And if the fertilization happened later, um, then because the sperm can live quite some time in the fallopian tube, then there can be uh, problems with implantation if the embryo is a bit older. You need um, a good level of progesterone in the system and not too, and not massive amounts of estrogen. And this is where people, when people are getting perimenopausal, this is when those hormones can start to, to change their concentrations and then there, there are issues. Um, hatching is really important. So if there are issues with the embryos not being able to hatch, and those trophoblast cells, those outer cells need to attach and invade. And the endometrium needs to be plentiful. So it needs to be thick enough. And as women age, their cycles can get shorter and shorter, which then doesn't give enough time to make um, a good enough amount of endometrium. So how can we extend the window? Well, you can help can extend the window of, of um, being able to be, get pregnant older. Uh, healthy eggs. So you have, even though we make our, the females make their eggs um, in, the, in the embryo, in the primordial ovaries, you're already making your eggs. And so you have your grandchildren already inside you. That makes sense. Sounds a bit weird, but that's how it is. But 
when that egg is going to mature and be released in the menstrual cycle, then you have three to six months to make that egg as healthy as it possibly can be. Healthy sperm, you have three months to you know, cut back on things that are going to be detrimental to the sperm, the DNA, uh, take antioxidants and other things. Um, alternative therapies, there are a number of herbs and, and leaf extracts and uh, acupuncture that people um, discuss as being really good for challenging infertility. Supplements, you can take supplements of, of different um, nutritional compounds. Um, and lots of people buy things uh, from Amazon or IVF clinics that help supplement their diet. And so you're getting plenty of the cations, say for example, the calcium. Activity, you want the blood to be able to get to the ovaries, to get to the testes. And so you want to take all the goodies that you're taking to there. So moving around, getting your blood pumping, perhaps a good idea. But science has stepped in again and it's now possible, more than possible to, to have one's eggs frozen and, and then go back to them at a later stage. And so they will be frozen while they are from a young body and then you can revisit them with and, and do IVF, etc. cetera. Or um, as women get older and maybe, or have issues with their wombs uh, or, and those structures, then surrogacy is also um, a possibility. And we have um, an expert in the surrogacy law coming to talk to us uh, at the, in the career lecture.